So welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, great conference as well. Uh, really enjoying it. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about fate uh, because I was having a discussion with a colleague recently and talking about Erlang, and he's a, he's a big Scala fan. And I wanted to give some of the background as to, to the reason why I, in particular, have chosen Erlang for, for some of these systems. So I'm going to take you back to 1993. Uh, don't worry, there's not one for every year. Um, but essentially, my career started working for a company called Raycall uh, Communication Systems. And uh, the, the radio that you're seeing in front of you is uh, written in uh, uh, a real-time operating system called OSE, which is supported by, by Erlang. Uh, it was written in real-time C, so a bit of a link to, to Erlang there. But it was also written in, uh, in C. And um, it was written in uh, military standard 2167A. Anybody had the excitement of writing code in military standard 2167A? We calculated that I think we had 47 lines of comments for every single line of code that we had. It was, it was an awesome project. Um, so it, it, this was kind of my background to, to kind of small systems. I then moved to a, to a company called Iona. Iona Technologies were, were building Corber Orbs. Anybody still remember Corber? <laughs> um, but I, I also wrote um, an EJB container, and I, I was massively into to Java at the time. And uh, the way I did that, I, I blagged the contract, getting a, getting a, a, a contract to do some, some Java work, and uh, fell in love with the JVM. So I actually got addicted to bytecode comp compilation and wrote um, over the weekend with a, with a good friend, uh, something called J-Coverage, which got forked into to Kobachura, um, which did line coverage for, for, for Java. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed getting into that kind of depth of detail within the VM. Um, and at Iona, I spent way, way too much time worrying about getting things on and off the wire, marshalling things use, using IOP. And I got way too detailed into, into the power. Then I went to Disney. I spent uh, worked, at, worked at a Disney World for probably three years uh, as a consultant, and uh, worked on uh, the Disney Magic Band. So the the, the picture is somebody holding a, an RFID against a reader, and that was a, a billion dollar project, or it was, it was calculated to be a billion dollar project. I think they ended up spending about three three billion dollars in total. Probably the biggest project I'm, I'm ever going to end up working on. Um, it had lots and lots of crazy things. We had a, uh, a thousand, hundred thousand square feet of a of a soundstage in Disney Hollywood Studios as our demo space. I think we spent ten million dollars on demos. Uh, the demo space included planes, real planes, <laughs> buses, rides from the park. And these pictures that when you walk past, they, they changed and they would show your, your face. It was, it was cool stuff, um, but very Disney. Um, this was me. Um, Disney and I don't particularly get on, um, but I'm on the left, just in case it's not. <laughs> so this was probably the first time that we were, we were in the park, and uh, my handler, or our handler, uh, took us into the park, and. Uh, disappeared off and came back with these, these wonderful Disney ears. And uh, they'd had them beautifully inscribed with, a, with, a name, with our names. Um, so my name's Peter. Uh, my colleague's name, anybody guess what my colleague's name is? It, well done. <laughs> but where we were working was actually in Hollywood Studios. So uh, this is the, the Hollywood um, Hollywood Tower. Uh, it's it's a it's a great ride. I used to park my car just below that that building, so uh, my my trip into work would be listening to people screaming. Literally, <laughs> not much has changed actually. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I, but I, I distinctly remember on this on this huge project, um, particularly dark dark meeting. Three billion dollar project, every consultancy company involved, um, and just realizing that what we were doing was um, pretty uh, futile. Um, so myself and, a, and another colleague, we we went on the, the Hollywood um, Tower Hotel ri ride, 
random drop ride. It was the most in control I'd been that day. It was just superb, and it was a, it was a nice way of sort of getting away from that project. But around that time, this book came out. I loved this book. This book really resonated with what we were doing. So we were doing park simulations. We were looking at RFID throughout the park. 11,000 readers uh, within the park, 28,000 hotel rooms, each one with an RFID, uh, 46 square miles of Florida, 200,000 people in the parks at any one time. Um, you can't simulate those kind of things in Java. You can't create 200,000 processes. So what I was looking to do is basically build simulations of, of what we were doing within the park before we actually build hard, built the actual hardware. And we ended up building simulations in Erlang that were trivial in comparisons to, to what we would have had to, to have built in, uh, in Java. So, um, hello. <laughs> uh, that's kind of background to me. So now I, I work for William Hill. Um, and I'm hoping that this, this will link nicely to, to some of the, the issues that, that we have working in a, in a large-scale gambling company. So I represent the, the head of engineering. And we have a, a small team that are building interesting and cool stuff for, for William Hill. Why William Hill? Well, we deal with extreme scalability. And that's, that's what I think of when I think of extreme scalability. Our scalability is 464 bits per second in 2014. Um, we also have issues with massive concurrency. So. This is, this is our website on a Saturday, 3 o'clock, when all the football pitch, uh, matches are kicking off. We have about 5 million price changes a day. So we're Amazon, but we're changing our prices continuously. All the sort of things that you would ordinarily cash, you just can't cash because they're changing. We're also um, highly available. This isn't a picture from our data center, mainly because nobody in our, our operations team would ever wear something quite as trendy as those um, shoes and, and trousers. Um, but that's typical data center. Uh, 30, uh, always 24 by 7. Um, a lot of um, sports events are during public holidays. So that our system has to be available 24-7, th uh, 365 days a year. It needs to be fault tolerant. Uh, you can never assume this, the system is going to, to be running all the time. And I, I love this guy. It's probably my favorite picture. That he, He's worked out that he can just sit in the back. Uh, and he's, he's sufficiently weighty enough to make sure that the, the car doesn't fall apart. Um, but I'm surprised he's not kind of leaning forward trying to steal the car at the same time. Um, so it, our networks are dealing with about 160 terabytes of data a day. What does that look like? So this is, this is our, our, what we call our slipstream. So these are not live bets. It's a recording. But I'll, I'll, if I finish uh, on time, I'll, I'll show you a live stream as it's actually running now. But what you actually see is customers, their bets, and then what we call our, our event hierarchy. So what we do is we organize our sports into uh, football, international football, Premier League, Champions League. What it is is essentially is a, is a graph. A lot of what we're doing is, is dealing with graphs. So we have here the, the edges of the graph, uh, are, or rather the ends of the graph are individual customers, their bets, and then that, that actual hierarchy. And the, the system we're looking at here is, is reading that bet stream and, and dealing with that bet stream. So what, what are we building at the moment? We, we have a, a big program of work at the moment called Trafalgar. And Trafalgar is uh, taking the, the front end of our, of our system and rebuilding it away from a, a platform called OpenBet, which, which we use. Uh, so a couple of systems that we're building there is a um, product catalog. And the other thing that we're building is a, is a recommendation system. And they're two really key components that we're building this year. Um, and then underneath that, 
we are building so, some other components and we are looking at um, particularly in the areas of settlement, liability and bet capture. And they're kind of the core of, of what a gambling company is doing, or at least a, a sports betting company. And then the other piece of work that we're doing at the moment is around our trading platform. Our trading platform is, is huge. It's, it's, it's automating the, the pricing of all the, the events on the markets that, that we have. So on an average Saturday, we have typically around 100,000 markets that are available. And we're looking to seriously increase that, that number of markets, as are all the gambling companies. So we're looking to, to keep on stretching that and building out more and more and more and more. So the way that we do that is we, we automate that. So we take feeds from third parties. Those feeds provide state, and they, that state information goes into mathematical models that are, that are doing the prices. So at the moment, we are, we're, we're building a trading platform, and that the kind of areas that we're looking at there are in the, in the feed handlers, looking at match coverage, um, the actual pricing models that, that, we, that we build, the publishing rules behind that, so based on what's going on in the match as to whether or not that, that particular market is available, and then the actual resulting, which feeds into settlement. In terms of the Erlang bits, well, we use React. We use React quite a lot. Uh, have been using it for, for a little while now. Um, we use it in our, in our product catalog. So that's currently delivering uh, to, our, to our website um, right now. Um, and the other thing that we're building at the moment is our, our trading platform. So our trading platform is also built on top of, of React. The kind of the real interesting bits, not that they're not interesting, <laughs> but the real interesting bits where we are actually looking to use Erlang and Erlang in anger is uh, a piece called a, a recommendations platform that, uh, that I'll demo to you. We're looking at some work around settlement that we're also doing in Erlang. And we're also looking at, as our, as our trading platform develops, building that trading platform in Erlang. So we're currently building feed handlers. We're currently building other elements with it within that platform with it within Erlang. But another key technology that, that we see, that, that we really like, is uh, Kafka. Is anybody using Kafka at the moment? Is it? We, we get really, really good results out of Kafka. And what we're, what we're looking at using it for is our kind of fire hose. So we have our fire hose of bets. And we, we see Kafka as a way of being able to persist those bets and be able to replay those bets on demand. So the kind of architecture that, that we're looking at is very much with, with streams of activity that are coming into the system. And those streams can be many, many different things. So stream of bets, streams of liability, stream of prices. And we're looking at Kafka as a way of being able to um, store that information, to be able to persist that information. And then in cases of recovery that we can then go back to Kafka to actually ask Kafka for the, for the offset. And Kafka is, is something that we're, we're actively looking at as, as that kind of mechanism. So we're looking at this as a, as a general model of activity into Kafka and then producing product from that. So being s a little bit more specific, for example, on, on a settlement system, we're looking at delivering our stream of bets. So these are bets that are struck within the platform, delivering that as a stream into, into Kafka, delivering match state, so what is the current score, uh, and also delivering the opinion. So what's our, what's our value of, of, that, of that current market? What is our competitor's value of, of that market? And we're looking at taking those streams into Kafka, using them for a variety of different of, of uses. And one of those uses might be settlement. But the nice thing about putting it into Kafka, it allows us to then switch that usage into other places and other uses. So again, a little bit more specific. We can start thinking of this uh, as hierarchies. And a lot of what we do, a lot of sports is, is uh, or the way that we view sports, is a hierarchy in a graph. 
So here we have uh, our bets, our match state, our match opinion going into Kafka and then being essentially building a, a graph. And that graph consists of things at the top level, which are the individual events, so Leeds versus Liverpool. Then the actual market, and we offer a number of markets, as, as I said, so that market might be the 90-minute market. And then within those markets, we might have a number of selections. Now, those are the outcomes that you can bet on. So the, one of the outcomes might be Leeds, the other Liverpool, and the other one that a uh, draw. And then you can see the, the actual bets that are, that are on those selections. And what you end up with is a, is a graph. So the kind of place that, that we've been thinking about in terms of this problem was you know, the, the pretty obvious problem, uh, pretty obvious answer from, from, from Erlang would be treat everything as a process. So we, we see this as a, possibly a, a process graph with messages happening between those graphs, between the nodes on, those gra on that graph, or between the processes in that graph. So making it a, a bit more concrete here, we have a, an event at 3.30, we have a win market, we have a horse called Fatsota, and we are sending a message to the Fatsota process to say that that particular selection has won. And we're, we're thinking about ways that we can build that within, within the, uh, the Erlang system. And one of the ways that we're thinking about doing that is how can you both horizontally and vertically scale that solution? So <laughs> we're looking, obviously, at Docker as a mechanism of being able to do that. So we're looking at a way that we can uh, scale that solution, both horizontally and also vertically. So I'm following for Garrett, who did a, an awesome talk. And I, I've just changed one of my slides to, will it be evolvable? <laughs> uh, because he, he, was, he was talking about no longer calling things scalable. So will it be evolvable, evolvable? And I think a lot of the testing that we've done so far suggests that it will. So this is, this is a simple system that, that we've taken. It's a very, very small system currently. And we put it on a, on a 32 CPU box, drove it with a, with a, with a, a large amount of load, and we saw all 32 CPUs lighting up beautifully. And that's kind of some of the stuff that we're expecting from this platform, be able to scale as, as much as we want to be able to scale. So some of the ways that we're doing that uh, is thinking about how we, how we link these applications together, how we link them within, within containers. So another product that, that we really like is Elasticsearch. And we're using both uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana. And we're building dashboards. And again, going back to this idea of having um, Kafka as, as a central point that we can then drive these events from. What we've built is a, a dashboarding system that is showing live bets on the system. So we, we have, to within a minute, and it's probably a lot better than that, every bet that's placed in the system going into this Elasticsearch instance. And what that allows us to do is to see the number of bets. It also allows us to query directly into that bet graph. So it allows us to select an individual bet, see how many bets have been updated, see how many bets have been placed on that individual bet, and essentially start building queries into this stream. And we find Kafka very, very powerful for that. And it's also, um, it seems to be very, very performant. The, that's real time with probably the last six months of bets from, from our system loaded, loaded into that. And you see the, the queries are, are a simple click. And it allows you to see the, the different types of bets that have been placed, the different markets that those bets have been placed on. We can build dashboards that allow that, that data to be updated. And it's, it's all essentially JSON objects that are being fed into, into that Kafka system. So you can see that we, we started off with X thousand bets. We've ended up with, uh, I think, three bets for a, for a single customer. We've essentially gone all the way down to a single customer. We're going to leave that customer selected. And instead of looking at the, the last 15 minutes, 
we're going to look at the last seven days so you can see how many bets that customer has placed in, in seven days. So what this kind of tool allows us to do is to start really at the top level, drill down into the individual components within the system, and then build out the, the timeline and look at what, what customer has been doing during, during that period. So how, we, how are we linking these things together with it within Docker? Well, if we imagine uh, an Elasticsearch instance running in a, in a Docker container, Elasticsearch uses port 9200 uh, to expose it, its query API. Kibana needs to be able to discover that, that uh, host port that, that the machine is running on. And if we were to be writing an application that is wanting to, to also log that information into, into Elasticsearch, how can that application discover that, that from Docker? So if we were to be building an application, um, first thing that we would do if we wish to, to Dockerize that application is to, to build a Docker file. So we, another thing that we like, and this is turning into a conversation of what do we like. Um, we like, we like Erlang.mk. Erlang.mk makes the release process really, really simple. Uh, so we use Erlang.mk, and this is essentially what one of the Docker files would look like for one of our containers. So from whichever distribution that, that you use, in this case CentOS, copy from the, the underscore release directory, which is the release that's being built for this application. This application exposes a, a HTTP in interface, so you expose a, a port. And then we have an entry point, and that entry point is, is essentially running the release, but running that release with a console. That's, that's how we distribute our applications. Uh, one, two, three, four lines um, we use to, to build that, that, that application. But how do we then link those applications together? So at the moment in development, we're using a, a tool called Docker Compose. You know, it's, it's not a production uh, tool you can use yet. But what it allows you to do is to have a, a really simple YAML file that describes how you wish to link these applications together. So for the application that we're building, so we've got Elasticsearch, Kibana, and our application. How do we connect those applications together? Well, you use a, a Docker Compose file. And you can use this natively within Docker. You just set the links up with it within Docker itself. But for example, we are here saying, create me an Elasticsearch instance. We're using the, the Elasticsearch instance that, it, that is away, available from Elastic. We're telling um, the system what ports Elasticsearch exposes, in this case, 9200. We're also using uh, Kibana. So we, we have a, a package version of Kibana that, that we're using. And then the, the important thing in, 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 this, uh, in this picture is, is the link. So the link is telling you that uh, Kibana wants to be able to link to Elasticsearch. And com Docker Compose uses that in order to be able to set the communication paths between the, those machines. And so Kibana exposes itself on port 5601. And then for, for our application, very, very similar. Uh, so our app, you have your, your provider that you've, the, your, the name of your app and the provider that you've, that you've chosen. You store that in Docker Hub or your local Docker Hub instance. You provide uh, some hints to, um, to OTP that it's not running quite as it normally expects. So um, it's not a TTY. It stops things like OTP uh, when, when the uh, service starts up, stops it um, immediately uh, stopping the VM because it doesn't have a TTY that it's, that it's expecting. But we're also telling Docker what ports this application is exposing. And we're also telling it about the, the links that that application wants to be able to, to exploit. And what Docker actually does is sets, and it's really, really simple, it sets two environment variables. That's all Docker linking is really, really doing. So there's two environment variables that are being set. We're linking to Elasticsearch. So in this case, we've got Elasticsearch port 9200 TCP address uh, and Elasticsearch TCP port as well. And what that is and what Docker will do is it will actually set the locations, the IP address of where Elasticsearch is running, which container it's running in, and the port that has actually been used by Docker, because Docker uses ephemeral ports, and you need to be able to link to those, those ephemeral ports. 
And then the other thing that you, you do in your application is essentially set a little bit of configuration. And you can see in the, in the environment section within this application that we've, we've set uh, two variables here, which are the, the lowercase version of the environment variables that have been set that Docker expects. And we're going to set some defaults, and that's purely because defaults are usually a good thing. And we're going to set some defaults that basically say TCP underscore address is 127, and the port is 9200, which is, which is our standard port. And we've got an index prefix that we can use, and we, we essentially get, log, uh, we get um, our uh, Erlang system to pretend to be Logstash when it's actually pushing the data in. And then in the actual application, and again, this is a, another thing that we like. We, we really like GProc. Uh, so we're, we're using a little GProc uh, utility here where we're telling GProc in that first line in the, in the, in the get environment call, we're asking GProc to, when, when we get an environment, to go and look in the, the OS environments to start off with. That allows us to, to override it, and that's essentially the way that Docker will actually set these variables. And then the other mechanism is then to fall back to the application environment. So the idea being that if you're not running in this in a Docker environment, you can then just start this application up and it will do the sensible thing. And the sensible thing will hopefully be talking to um, the variables that have been set in the, in the local environment. And then you can see that the TCP address and the TCP port are just making calls to that, to that get env call. So we, we can configure GProc. GProc uses the environment if it can. Otherwise, it will look up in the application environment. Now, we have a, a small library that, that shows that linking that basically allows you to see how you connect Elasticsearch using Docker in, in this way. And it's available on GitHub on, on that particular URL if, you, if you're interested in the code. It is a, a tiny amount of code. The other piece that we're looking at is uh, sports betting recommendations. So very much the way that, that Amazon does their recommendations, we're also looking at doing. And what we're looking at building is essentially based off that graph, that whole graph we, we store for a, for a period of time. And then what we do is we then go and look at what other customers have done in that graph. And remember this graph is essentially everything that you're seeing in that graph is an Erlang process that's stored within a VM. And what we're doing is we're looking at the relationships between the nodes on that graph. So when a customer asks for a recommendation on sports betting, what we do is we go and trans traverse the graph, traverse the process tree, and go and ask the process tree for recommendations. So the way that we're doing that, and here's some, here's some math. We're using something called the Jacquard coefficient. And the Jacquard coefficient is, is really quite simple. Um, it's essentially taking the, the cardinality of the intersection of two sets and dividing it by the cardinality of the union of two sets. So it's actually a very, very simple operation to, to, to do in order to get recommendations. So what, what does that look like? So if we, if we imagine a customer, and a customer who's placed three bets, and I place three bets on three different selections, so three different outcomes. So think of a selection as your team. And they place three, di three different bets on three teams. What recommendations would we offer to that customer in this graph? So in order to be able to give a recommendation, we need a, a customer that's connected to that, to that customer. So in this case, we, we have another customer called B. And that customer has a, have also placed a bet on, the select, on a selection, and in this case, they've bet on selection W. What we do is we, we navigate the graph, and again, the graph is uh, processes, they're, they're all Erlang processes, and we navigate the graph, and we go and look at everybody else who's placed a bet on that selection. So the Jacquard coefficient in this case is, um, the uh, cardinality of the intersection, and in this case, the, the intersection is, is just one, uh, divided by the cardinality of the, of the union, and in this case, four. So the, way, the Jacquard coefficient that we get for this customer for, for the recommendation is one quarter. Another customer. Same customer A, but customer C in this case. 
In this case, we have an overlap of two. So the Jacquard coefficient here is two quarters, one half. So the cardinality of the intersection is two, and the cardinality of the union is, is four. So what the system does is, using processes and exploiting the, the Erlang VM, sends messages to all these nodes, all, all these processes. And what we essentially end up with is, is a, uh, a recommendation for, for that customer, and it's a weighted recommendation. And this is a simplification, obviously, of, of the algorithm that, that we're using, but it's, it's the basic principles of how this system is working. Uh, we essentially would then offer a recommendation for, for that customer A, and the weight of that recommendation would be half for selection Z and 0.25 for, uh, for selection V. We're also doing uh, work on sports mapping. So sports mapping is where we take feeds from uh, external suppliers. The external suppliers have IDs that they represent. So there's a, uh, an ID for the Leeds versus Liverpool match. We obviously represent that differently in our system. It has a, a different ID. And we also trade matches from different providers depending on their availability and other factors that, that we're interested in. So this is, this is an example of, of another Erlang system. Um, it's, a, it's a mapping system. Uh, we really like VizJS as well. All of, most of these graphs have come from VizJS. Uh, and what it's essentially doing is, is building the graph and building the, um, the relationships between uh, um, nodes that have been created by the feed provider versus nodes that have been created by us. So games that we wish to trade versus games that, w versus games that we have coverage for. And what happens here is, and luckily we're on the Swedish Alsvenska League. I do hope I've not completely mispronounced that. Um, but what you can see in yellow is, uh, is some data that we've got from a, a feed provider. And in blue, is the data that we've actually built ourselves. And what we're doing is we're linking the data between both the data that's come from the feed provider and the data that's come from, from ourselves. So we can then translate a dangerous attack from a, from a feed provider for a particular match into a dangerous attack in, the, uh, in, our, in our system. Now, I forget why I put this slide in, but I like this slide. <laughs> I've, I've also stolen most of the good pictures from Francesco. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what we're trying to avoid. So this has been a, a very Erlang-specific talk. Um, we do lots of tech. We do lots of tech in, in different, different platforms. Uh, so we, we build lots of stuff in Java. Um, we've got some Scala going on. Um, we do a lot of Angular at the moment, uh, a lot of Spring. Uh, we use Puppet for, for a number of our deployments as well. Um, we're also looking a lot at Spark. Um, and Node.js is, is also in our platform. So by no means are we exclusively using Erlang, but we are seeing in certain platforms, it really hits the spot. It really is. Um, scaling to the kind of levels that, that we want. And uh, it's, it's working well so far in the kind of applications that, that we have. So a little note from my employer. <laughs> We're hiring. <laughs> um, if any of this looks interesting, come catch me. Um, be very interested to, to talk to you about it. Um, and if there are any questions, now's the time to start. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll run the, the the slipstream now, so that it's kind of in the background. So that, and then maybe if there are no questions, then we can talk through that. So this is live now. Um, I don't tend to run this on really busy days because, as you can see, it, it tends to, to freak out. But it's more the JavaScript bit that, than anything else. Um, what will happen is this, this graph will build, and it will it will organize itself. Well, maybe it won't. <laughs> um, 
hoping that's not going to do that for too long. Um, it must be quite busy at the moment. But essentially, every bet, as it's struck, goes onto this system. Uh, so every online bet on William Hill is currently landing on my laptop. Uh, and it basically connects for 20 seconds and, uh, and then stops. Yeah, well, Sorry. Question. Um, in your uh, recommendation system, I didn't really understand the, the value of representing graph uh, nodes as processes. Are they acting in some way on some information by themselves? Because it sounds like there's more like an actor that's trying to find recommendation and get you to navigate some graph that you put. It, it is navigating a graph. It's, it's in memory because of the speed of the recommendation that we need to be able to deliver. So we're planning to put this into a part of the system where it's very, very time critical. Um, so what we want to be, do is build a, a graph structure in memory to be able to do that. If we were to look at other structures like a more tabular type, type of structure and persist that to, to this, I think that would, that would affect the, the kind of I.O. the issues that and would slow down that, that process. Does that, does that answer your question, or is it? No, but I'm maybe missing something. So. <laughs> it's, it's more to do with the way that when we ask a recommendation, what we can do is we can get each of the connected processes to go and do the work as part of that recommendation. So that allows us to make that recommendation very, very, power, very, very, very parallel. Um, that's that's the principal reason. The the example I gave you, where there were just three, that can be thirty thousand. Um, for the recommendation system, do you only consider uh, the same selection or like different selections on the same market? Uh, we do lots. That's we do lots of variants of of what I described. Um, we're, 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 we're trialing out different algorithms at the moment. Um, so the, the algorithm I described is, is one of the algorithms that, that we're looking at. Um, I guess it depends is the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, this is a follow-on question from the first one. Um, so how do you find uh, customers who similar to the your customer you're trying to provide a recommendation to? So the, the way that we do that is this, this graph here, this is a customer. The yellow circle is a customer. These are the bets that customer has placed. And these are the selections that a customer has placed those bets on. So these, these uh, darker blue. I'm not sure, can you see that from the back OK? Yeah. So well, that's probably a bit better. So here you go. So here's a customer. Here's the selection. So Leeds, Liverpool, whatever your favorite team. Sorry, they're the bets. These are the selections here. So we're in tennis here. And what we do is we, we look at customers who are connected to that customer. So we use the connectivity of that graph in order to be able to build the recommendations. So you can see here, here's, here's a customer. They are connected to this customer because they're both placed a bet on this same selection. So essentially, the graph builds up bets, customers, selections, and then there's the, the whole hierarchy of events that, that we have. Uh, it's, it's in memory, and they're all LLM processes. So we send a, a message to that customer, say, give me the recommendations. And it then causes a, a cascade of, of messages from that customer to all the connected uh, nodes. So roughly, how many processes is that running in the Hun Hundreds of thousands. Lots of hundreds of thousands. Okay, we have time for one more question. Or let's just thank the speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>